Again, its inhabitants took to the roads to escape the pursuing fire. The cathedral crashed in place. The invaders rolled on. Morning found the refugees still fleeing blindly. Reputable observers said these refugees were machine gunned from the air. There is no photographic evidence of this. And this is what they fled. The massing machine moved on, and after a day's destruction, paused only to sleep. This was Antwerp, where the democracies had fired oil tanks as their armies retreated. The improvised Allied defense collapsed. The British Army was driven into the Sea of Dunkirk, according to plan. Dunkirk has been called the triumph of man over the machine. To challenge the dive bombers, Spitfires rose from British bases and fought for the domination of the air over the desolate beach, while ground forces continued a stubborn rear guard action. British ships, cruisers, destroyers, yachts, paddle boats, anything that could float, crossed the channel and evacuated some 350,000 British and French troops back to England. For the British were determined to save their men. Here in the wreckage was the story of the epic evacuation. Men walked into the sea and swam to their rescuers. They couldn't take their weapons, trucks, tanks or guns, but men were saved to fight again. Having slashed through Luxembourg, Belgium and Holland, five German armies fanned out across France. Treachery and incompetence had doomed the nation that only a decade ago had been leader of Europe. Now the campaign mounted in fury as France crumbled. On June 10th, four days before France fell, Mussolini entered the war. He had waited until that moment to make his decision. And now the Nazis entered Paris. This had been the dream of the Kaiser in the last war. Hitler achieved it. And the Maginot Line was still there. The Nazis had merely outflanked it. Now they tried direct attack, and the Maginot Line fell. The 
The First World War had ended officially in this railroad car, where Marshal Foch had received the delegates of the vanquished Germans. Hitler commandeered the car for what he believed was the end of the Second World War. Vichy was born. Hitler was happy. Britain alone remained as Hitler's sole barrier to a total victory. Nazi submarines now berthed on the conquered coast set out to starve the British people into submission. Nazi planes, now only a few minutes flight from the English coast, set out to bomb the British people into submission. Britain hung on. They bombed railroads and factories to disrupt transportation and war production. They bombed by day, and when the Royal Air Force smashed more than 180 of the bombers out of the sky in one session, they bombed by night. The face of London changed. Historic landmarks disappeared. Night after night, London was left a sea of fire. Coventry. Air armadas appeared over these cities through the fall and winter of 1940 and well into the spring of 1941. Wreckage was cleared and production continued. A new army was created equipped with new weapons. And Hitler frustrated turned east. If this were to be a long war, he would need Russian oil and Russian wheat. So he proclaimed himself anew the arch enemy of communism, despite his earlier plea to the German people that national socialism and communism could live side by side. Now he told them he didn't mean what he said before, but he did mean what he said before that. Military spokesmen in Berlin said the Red Armies would be encircled and destroyed within six weeks its remnants would retreat back of the Urals. There the Japanese could deal with them at the proper time. Joseph Stalin rallied the Russian people. Soldiers and civilians responding with a unanimity that amazed a world that had heard much and knew little of them, rose to repel and harry the invaders. Working with whatever tools they could seize, Working against time, men and women, old and young, carved these huge tank traps. Weapons were distributed to civilian guerrillas assigned to operate back of enemy lines. And the aircraft guns swung into place to battle Luftwaffe advance units. Here was the wheat that Hitler wanted, and Russian men, women, and children were determined to keep it out of his hands. They would have neither food nor shelter. Factories worked day and night, for the Russians knew this was a war of machines. Entire plants were moved east, complete with workers. Weapons of war poured out of these factories, and the Germans, as well as the rest of the world, discovered the Russians had tanks to meet tanks and planes to meet planes. The Russians retreated, but not without inflicting sizable casualties. Be the 
German prisoners captured seemed shocked at the ruthless opposition they encountered. It had been different in France. Winter found the Russian army still intact. German casualties mounted until they were counted in the millions. Hitler's armies were not smashed in the winter campaign, but the Russians gained the initiative and held it. As the snows melted, Hitler was to meet new Russian armies and new machines as summer came to the 2,000 mile front. We were not sufficiently on the alert in Hawaii. The Japanese won a series of spectacular victories in the Pacific. Under General Douglas MacArthur, American and Filipino forces fought a fabulous delaying action in the Philippines. Manila was bombed, although it was declared an open city. Because of vast distances, it was impossible to send supplies or reinforcements. And Bataan fell, only when Americans and Filipinos had eaten their mules. General MacArthur established his headquarters in Australia and as Commander-in-Chief of the United Nations forces in that area, prepared for the offensive that would develop inevitably. For despite setbacks, we had established a supply chain 6,000 miles across the Pacific that stretched to New Zealand. Like the other democracies, we were not prepared for total war. Fortunately, under the Lend-Lease Act of March 1941, we had set out to become the arsenal of the free and fighting nations. We were determined to supply them with our war goods, whether they could afford to pay or not. We were buying time. Time to convert the industries of peace into war. Time to make ships, merchant ships and war ships. Time to make planes and more planes, bombers and fighters, faster, more powerful than any the world had ever seen. Time to make guns, and more guns, shells, and more shells, tanks, and more tanks. Time to gather the huge strength which was ours, to pour the great riches of American Earth into the cauldron of war. Iron, steel, oil, coal. Time to build a navy called upon to fight in both oceans and upon all the seas, to convoy men and weapons to Australia, to Britain, to the Middle East, to Russia. A navy that had already undertaken daring raids upon the Gilbert and Marshall Islands and brave Japanese waters and had taken a heavy toll of the invading forces in the Macassar Strait and had won the first battle in the Coral Sea. Time to expand a miniature professional army into a modern war machine. Time to take civilians gathered in a peacetime conscription while we were still debating. To mold them into soldiers. Train them in the use of new weapons, new tactics. And we were buying time to weld the home front and the fighting front into one. For this was total war, and we realized victories were born in the production line. We needed more ships, more planes, more tanks, more guns, more shells. We were not fighting alone. Nine of the Pan-American neighbors severed diplomatic relations with the Axis. Colombia, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, and Venezuela. At this time, the issue is clearly drawn. There can be no peace until Hitlerism and its monstrous parasites are utterly obliterated, and until... Nine of the Pan-American nations declared war upon the aggressors. Cuba, Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama. Mexico joined these nations in June 1942. We were not fighting alone. Even in the conquered countries, the will to fight survived. Dutch, Belgium, Yugoslav, Greeks, Czechs, Filipinos, Poles, Norwegians, 
three Frenchmen, all fought with us on the far-flung battlefield. Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, Canadians. We were not fighting alone in this war of the people seeking a world without war for their children. Britain, growing steadily stronger in its third year of war, sweeping the skies of conquered Europe, harassing the enemy with commando raids, sending forth huge armadas of bombers over German cities Hitler promised would never be attacked. Russia, fighting with an unparalleled tenacity, drawing upon inexhaustible reserves, asking no mercy and offering none. China, knowing the patience of an ancient civilization, surmounting handicaps that would have destroyed other nations, fighting on as it had fought alone. And the people of the United States, an angry people, whose resources and privileges were the envy of the world, offering these without stint, fighting in the factories and the foxholes, fighting in the jungles, the deserts, the frozen wastes, fighting on all the oceans, fighting for survival, fighting a war which would be hard and might be long, but which they would win.